I'm thinking about this book I read a while back called Why God Won't Go Away. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't really interested in the God bit, but it was talking about neuroscience and how uh, the stuff of the world, you know, kind of sense data, is turned into experience. And it was written at least partly by this neuroscientist called Andrew Newberg, who looks at the neuroscience of religion. But uh, one of the things it's talking about is what he calls cognitive operators, which I've spoken about before actually, but I'm just thinking about them again in relation to something else. And uh, cognitive operators, in the terms of that book at least, are uh, kind of routine procedures that the brain performs on sense data. Because, uh, you know, when the information comes in, it's just unprocessed raw data, really. You know, it's just electrochemical signals, or, um, yeah, that's basically what it is, really. It's just electrochemical signals of different kinds coming into the brain. You know, and some of it we might call sound, and some of it we might call sights, and some of it we might call smells. But that's the interpretation we give it after it's been processed. Before that, it's just, as I say, just electrochemical signals doing the thing with the dendrites and the axons and the synaptic clefts and all those things in the brain. So, uh, so out of that data, out of that mass of unsorted data, we have this experience that I'm having now, you know, which is like being alive and awake in a world that contains things like sights and sounds and smells, uh, and which is organised in a, in a, what feels like a fairly rational way, a way I can understand. So, uh, so that data is processed in certain ways, certain standard ways, and as I say, in that book at least, there is those standard processes are referred to as cognitive operators. Uh, different uh, ideas, different neuroscient uh, neuroscientific theories use different words, and they've got them divided up in different ways. But the basic idea must be pretty, you know, must, there must be some truth in that basic idea. Clearly something's happening to the, to the raw data of the world, to turn it from bits into its, if I can borrow John Wheeler's term, to turn the bits of information into the it of the world. Uh, so yeah, so some kind of operations are happening. The ones that uh, are in the book I just mentioned, that Andrew Newberg and Eugene de Killian, somebody else, wrote, is, uh, I think it's about seven or eight of them, I can't remember them all. But the ones that jump out and the ones which are really easy to understand, I think, are the binary operator the reductive operator and the holistic operator. So I'll just go through those, because it's not really what I want to talk about. But the binary operator basically just divides, does a kind of primary division on the information and divides it into, into two parts. That's it. And those two parts might be represented in all kinds of different ways. So all the binaries that exist within our thinking are as a result of that primary binary definition. So we might divide it into up, down, or left, right, or front, back black, white, good, bad, top, bottom, all, all the binaries that we have are uh, inside, outside, yeah. Um, that, those kind of binaries are a part of the function of the binary operator. Uh, that's, that's really clear. The second one I mentioned is a reductive operator, which is, uh, actually the holistic operator is easier, top of that one first. The holistic operator clumps things together. So, uh, so all this all this information that's pouring into my eyes from over that general direction is being clumped together into my holistic experience of a tree. You know, I'm not seeing it like I'm just a, a, a buzzing cloud of atoms as deep back chopper cups. I'm not, I'm not seeing that. What I'm seeing is this singular entity called a tree. Uh, so something's happening there to clump the information together. And if I could hear the tree, you know, if there was windows blowing and its branches were swaying, then that uh, sonic information would also be clumped into the same experience. So we'd be seeing and hearing the tree at the same time. Uh, so that's the holistic operator. And just to return to the reductive operator, that's kind of the reverse of that. Uh, as well as seeing things clumped together into holes, we do also experience the world, at least partially, as broken into, uh, into parts, usually related parts. Uh, so, for example, just walk past this stick on the ground. Here's this stick on the ground here. Let's see if it's in the shot. Yeah, it is. Oh, my dog's seeing it now. But it's got this break in the middle, and I can just kind of feel my brain shattering it into two parts. <laughs> my dog is sniffing it. Oh, well. So, anyway, it's, it's the, the, the reductive operator also breaks things into parts. And you can do it on demand. You know, I can look at this tree to return to this tree again, and I, and I can do the branches thing, or I can see the twigs. 
I can kind of shatter it in my mind on demand. But it's also, but things are also breaking up around me just naturally because of that processing that's going on. So I'm not seeing an undivided holistic world unless I kind of choose to or unless I take some kind of drugs. I'm seeing fences, I'm seeing trees, I'm seeing fields and dogs and it's being broken up in a, in a way which makes sense. All right, so that's those things. But one of the, yeah, God, it's taken me ages to explain that. That's not really what I wanted to talk about. Well, I'll just, I'll just give an intro to what I wanted to talk about anyway. One of the ones that Eugene Tequilly and Andrew Newberg talk about is what they call the existential operator. It's a complicated word. But what they mean by that is, the, uh, is that as well as seeing things, we also are able to tell whether they're real or not. We have a sense that what we're looking at is real, or, or occasionally we have a sense that it's not real. Uh, we can tell the difference between the real and the fake. And a lot of the games we play with uh, pictures or with optical illusions or with film and television or with animation, a lot of the games that we play are about exploiting that strange difference. You know, we quite like things that look as if they're real and then they're not. Or we like things that look as if they're not real and then turn out to be real. So it's a game that we play to amuse ourselves. But according to this theory I'm talking about at least, it's, it's one of the operations that our brain carries out on the experience or rather it t carries out on data to turn it into experience. So I'm looking out across this field in Cheshire and as well as it being broken into parts by the reductive operator and, and clumped into holes by the holistic operator and separated into binary opposites like the sky and the ground very clearly in this shot uh, by the binary operator as well as that uh, it's also, I'm also experiencing it as real I don't feel as if I'm in a dream right now uh, but you know, but there are experiences, and certainly I've had experiences where I have felt like that. And there's, 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 a, there's a shift, uh, and there's some syndromes: Capgras syndrome, Cotard syndrome. There's one or two neurological problems that people can have, which absolutely do do that. Which you know, all the sense data is, is all the mechanical stuff is happening to the sense data, but it isn't given this quality of uh, of realness that it really exists, and you feel as if you're living in a an unreal world. Oh God. Anyhow, I mean, that's just, that was the main thing I wanted to talk about, which I guess I'll do at a different time, but it's this, it's this existential operator. I think there's a difference between that operator and the other ones that they talk about. I think the other ones, and those three that I've given are illustrations, the reductive, the binary and the holistic operator, I mean, they're kind of mechanical processes that's happening to data. You know, they're almost like the fractioning column in an oil refinery. You know, you pour the data in at the top and it comes out in an orderly sorted fashion at the bottom, kind of. Uh, they're mechanical processes. But the existential operator is different. It seems to me that that's uh, kind of taking the output and then assigning some kind of quality to it. It's looking at the output of those data and saying, yes, that's a tree and it's real. Or that's a tree and it's a fake. It exists in reality or it doesn't exist in reality. It seems to me that's a different kind of process and it's a felt process I think which for me at least seems to be very close to those other felt processes that I've talked about before on these videos. You know the feeling of knowing that you get when uh, when you know something to be true and which is you know occasionally absent from people who have problems with believing stuff um, or which is over you know, kind of overdone in some people who believe things too readily. Or well, that feeling of meaningfulness that I've talked about. You know, that, that again is, uh, you know, occasionally absent from people who have problems with that, and uh, sometimes again overstated in people who attribute too much meaning to everything. We live in a world of constant significance. But these are secondary processes on the data of the world. It seems to me. You know, the the. the, the the feeling that you know something to be true is different to the existence of that thing. That's not right. Yeah, it seems that, yeah, it's, it's one of those, I think. It's the feeling of, uh, like you can have the feeling of knowing something and you can have the feeling that something means something. So I think you can have the feeling that something exists. The existential operator in that system I talked about years ago. Feeling that something is real. I'll have to think again about that, I think.